So my talk today is, is the rule of law dead? Uh, my great friend Lenore Ely here said, you need to come up with a topic, a title that's provocative. And so I hope that is sufficiently provocative, Lenore. So as everyone knows, on August 8th, the Federal Bureau of Investigation raided Mar-a-Lago, which is where Donald Trump's residence in Florida is at present. And the FBI took alleged classified documents from this building. And we have two narratives developing about what took place there. So commentators on the right say that equipping, empowering, and weaponizing federal law enforcement to attack political adversaries is a threat to the rule of law that is turning the U.S. into a banana republic. There's a Fox News headline that says, FBI raid on Trump, latest proof of democratic war on rule of law. Now there's a narrative on the left, a counter narrative, which says that attack, attacks on the integrity of the FBI are threats to the rule of law and that no man, however powerful, is above the law. Both of these narratives appeal to the concept of rule of law. Now, if we jump back a few years ago to when Donald Trump was actually president, there are a few little headlines. So this is one from the New York Times. The headline reads, Donald Trump could threaten U.S. rule of law, scholars say. MSNBC headline says, will the rule of law survive under Trump? Well, both of these headlines presuppose that the rule of law is active and very much alive and in existence in the United States. Otherwise, there would be nothing for Donald Trump to threaten. Interestingly, there's a different title that Reason Magazine ran. So Reason Magazine is sort of a flagship libertarian magazine. And its headline reads, The Immoral Rule of Law Behind Trump's Deportation Regime. Huh, this is a different take. This take sort of implies that rule of law is bad and that Donald Trump's policies enact the rule of law, but that that's a bad thing. So this is interesting. We have, on the one hand, people saying Donald Trump threatens the rule of law, and on the other hand, people saying Donald Trump stands for the rule of law, and that's a bad thing. So which is it? Does Donald Trump jeopardize or safeguard the rule of law? Well, to even begin to answer a question like this, we have to know a little bit about what the rule of law is. The rule of law is multifaceted. It encompasses multiple legal principles. Chief among them is that the rules that govern society apply equally to all individuals within the prescribed jurisdiction. No person, not the king, not the president, not a powerful CEO, is above the law. Law, not the arbitrary commands or categorical dictates of human rulers, is supreme. So the opposite of the rule of law conceptually is the rule of man, the rule of people, or the idea that the formal discretionary imperatives of a powerful sovereign necessarily bind his or her subjects and subordinates. The rule of law is a philosophical concept and a liberal ideal that gained descendancy during the Enlightenment. You can think about figures like Locke or Montesquieu, but it can be traced back to antiquity. You can think about Aristotle. For those of you who remember Aristotle in the politics, he has this debate with himself where he says, is it better to be ruled by good law or by good leader? And he goes through the pros and cons of being ruled by good law versus the pros and cons of being ruled by a good leader. And he eventually falls on the side of law and says it is better in the end to be ruled by law than it is to be ruled by a person. 20th century British jurist Albert Van Dicey, he's sort of a, a Whig constitutionalist, listed these prime characteristics of the rule of law, and there are three. The first one, the absolute supremacy or predominance of regular law as opposed to the influence of arbitrary power. So consistency, regularity, regularity, 
as against arbitrariness. The second, equality before the law or the equal subjection of all classes to the ordinary law of the land administered by ordinary law courts. So the operative phrase here is equality for the law. Every single human being is bound by the same laws. No one is above the law. The third criteria is that the rule of law is a formula for expressing the fact that with us, and he's speaking about England, which does not have a written constitution, that with us, the law of the constitution, the rules which in foreign countries naturally form a part of a constitutional code, and here he's referring to civil law systems, are not the source, but the consequence of the rights of individuals as defined and enforced by courts. In other words, under a civil law scheme, you have the promulgation of general principles of law and litigation and courts determine the particulars based on sort of the superstructure of a code. Whereas, at least in theory, in the common law system, according to Dicey, the rights of the individual are antecedent to any promulgation, and the law responds to that first principle that every human being is entitled to dignity and bodily integrity. These three criteria suggest that the rule of law is a bottom-up rather than a top-down system of governmental ordering based on already enunciated and widely accepted precepts. The operative rules that regulate the normative order of human activity in a free society under the law are rooted in custom on this view. A ruler or a judge is, in such a happy jurisdiction, responsive to the controlling principles that are antecedent to his or her political election, appointment, or empowerment. So the laws come before the ruler. Every ruler is subordinate to law. Law is supreme. I want to go on a little bit of a digression here to talk for a minute about identity politics um, and how identity politics disrupt this sort of idealized notion of the rule of law. So, for example, in the United States, at least, and a lot of my references will be U.S. specific, but in the United States, courts don't have the power to enforce their opinions. If people want to disregard a Supreme Court opinion, let's just say on the state level, because it's, it's easier to imagine this happening at a state level. If a large group of people were to say, ah, we disagree with that Supreme Court opinion, and we're not going to follow it, what can the court do? The court depends upon the executive branch to enforce the law. So in this, state, in this state example, somebody in the district attorney's office or somebody in the attorney general's office would have to step in and enforce the law. But if in this, let's just say we have a hypothetical where 95% of the population disagrees with the legal principle, but let's say that this legal principle that is developed in, in, in a case is actually right legally in terms of a Supreme Court opinion. Let's say the rationale is correct and the interpretation of the statute is just spot on, but people don't agree with the law. Say it's 95% of the people. Well, who's going to follow that Supreme Court opinion? Nobody. So judges, you'll find in uh, court opinions, although they are trying to reach the right result, they will often seek moderate results to maximize citizen buy-in to the court's legitimacy and to widespread popular acceptance of judicial decisions as authoritative. Now, why would identity politics disrupt rule of law? Well, identity politics can undermine the rule of law because of competing cultures. In the United States, we have a state of fracture and division, unlike any that I've known in my lifetime and probably my parents' lifetime as well. And courts will suffer reputational costs 
by suffering with one interest group over another. So most people, when they hear the results of a Supreme Court opinion, whether it's the United States Supreme Court or whether it's a state Supreme Court, all they hear is this side won or this side lost. They don't take the time to read the opinions and to understand the posture of the case. Maybe there's a procedural technicality that led to one outcome or another. Or they don't reason through the opinion of the justices. And so they miss all that complicated analysis that goes into arriving at the operative opinion. All they see are results. My team won or my team lost. And as our society gets increasingly fractured, this becomes problematic in high-profile, say, social cases. Most people, most of the time, don't understand what the courts do. Most court opinions at the appellate level are pretty boring. They involve technical issues or disputes that aren't really newsworthy. And so people don't follow the opinions of the courts that closely. But in these very high-profile cases, when controversial issues are at stake, people scrutinize Supreme Court opinions, whether they're at the state level or at the U.S. Supreme Court level. And here is where the court has to factor into its analysis its own institutional legitimacy. Originalism rejects this approach, and originalism is a way of ruling that looks at the original public meaning of words and tries to determine basically on a strict textualist approach how to, how to interpret the case. But there are certain results that come from that that people reject. For example, in the latest opinion in Dobbs, you know, roughly half the country thinks that's a bad opinion and half the country thinks that's a great opinion. I personally think it's a great opinion. I think it decentralizes the controversial issue of abortion. It sends it back to the states and you have a healthy degree of pragmatic pluralism. But there are a lot of people who want to reject the legitimacy of that opinion. And this is why sort of tribalist identity politics is problematic because it undermines the rule of law. When people no longer view the opinions of a Supreme Court as authoritative or legitimate, the rule of law is undermined. So Friedrich Hayek identified the rule of law as a defining attribute of the common law system, which in his view stood in contradistinction to the civil law system that instituted vast codes and complex administrative agencies to superintend the unvigilant populace. Now, Hayek is working with a construct here. I mean, most of us have some degree of familiarity with the common law versus the civil law system, and they are sort of merging. In civil law systems, we had this, Jesus Maria and I had this conversation yesterday. In civil law systems, judges are beginning to follow precedent because it gives them cover. They want to reason by analogy from a prior decision, and that gives them a little bit of, uh, of I say cover, because they don't have to feel as if they're standing alone. They can say, I'm just doing what these other judges have done before. So although they don't have stare decisis as a doctrine that they're required to follow, in fact, they are starting to institute stare decisis in their decisions. Legislatures, of course, are accountable to the people through elections, so their enactments, legislation, statutes, must reflect extant social practices and beliefs to satisfy voters. Otherwise, what happens? You try to get reelected, you won't get reelected. Administrative agencies with their extensive rulemaking powers aren't so accountable. They are by design removed from legislative procedures and thus isolated from voters. So the administrative state in the United States has sort of grown into a fourth branch of government. It has its own executive and agency head. It has its own judicial branch within it. It's got ALJs, and it's got its own legislative function. It promulgates rules and regulations. Each executive agency is a creature of statute. It's, it's a product of legislation, but it is tucked away in the executive branch, which is supposed to enforce law. 
And so that arrangement sort of breaks down what Montesquieu described in his sort of tripart view of, 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 of uh, separation of powers, where you have a legislative, executive, and judicial branch, and it adds a fourth branch to the mix that is less accountable. It's, it's harder to check by the other three branches. Hayek saw the common law as a decentralized form of social organization and civil law as centralized planning and design. The rule of law, he thought, adhered in the former system, in the common law system, but not the latter. Here's what he has to say. The possession of even the most perfectly drawn up legal code does not, of course, ensure that certainty which, with, with which the rule of law demands, and it therefore provides no substitute for a deeply rooted tradition which the common law embodied. The rule of law encapsulates other concepts as well. So the predictability, consistency, reliability, neutrality, and clarity of working rules. These are all sort of subsidiary, though. They are all derived from the principal teaching that, in Hayek's words, all rules apply equally to all, including those who govern. So if you go to the U.S. court system's website and you look up rule of law, it will provide a definition, and it will say rule of law is dependent on an independent judiciary and that all, all people are accountable to rules that are publicly promulgated, equally enforced, independently adjudicated. And the fourth one, which is sort of interesting, and I would say novel, at least to the U.S. conception, is consistent with uh, international human rights and principles. All these subsidiary rules, which I mentioned, are, are derived from the principle of teaching that all rules apply equally to all. Well, by any appreciable standard, the United States has not lived up to this high ideal in light of the growth of doctrines like sovereign immunity and qualified immunity. You probably all know what this is. A, a, a sovereign immunity is when uh, a, a government agent who is alleged to have um, had, let's say, tortious conduct is absolved of all liability because he is operating purely as an agent of the state, whereas more qualified immunity means that, okay, you don't get absolute immunity if, you, if your behavior meets certain criteria, then you may be entitled to immunity, but it's not a given. But sovereign and qualified immunity, they are common law doctrines, and they developed in a culture of royal prerogative and government privileges, mon monarchical privileges. These seem to uh, contradict Hayek's sort of narrative about the purity of, of the common law system and its implications for the rule of law. The United States has suffered from disparate treatment of individuals based on their political power and connections. I mean, two immediate examples come to mind. Uh, people talk about this with Hillary Clinton and her email servers and whether her illicit activity should have been uh, prosecuted. And then the rapid rise of the administrative state. That is, that is a fundamental threat to the rule of law. A new notion of the rule of law has developed in recent years that is at odds with the traditional liberal view of the rule of law. And this is one that I think is captured in that reason headline I mentioned earlier that suggested that the rule of law is a bad thing. And this view associates rule of law with a law and order mentality that emphasizes punishment, severity, and rigidity as touchstones of the legal system. On this view, the rule of law is the instantiation of brute force or the execution of raw power or perhaps an ideological construct meant to condition people into servile submission to government authority. This is a view captured in a law review article by John Hosnos called The Myth of the Rule of Law. And there's actually a lot of merit to this view. So in John Hosnos' uh, law review article, he takes a bunch of hypotheticals from students. Uh, and he'll say, okay, imagine there's this student in the class and it's a female and she's a bleeding heart liberal and she agrees that this principle of law 
is right and correct and sound. And then there's another guy in her class who is this sort of uh, stereotypical conservative, and he believes that this exact same principle is good and right and sound. However, when they go through the analysis of a hypothetical in their course, they arrive at completely different conclusions. They agree on the general principles, but in the application of the principles, they disagree. They can't come to any agreement. And John Hosnoff says, why is this the case? And he says that because law is full of general principles, that there's so much flexibility and ambiguity and wiggle room within them that judges are necessarily political animals working their way to whatever political conclusion they want to reach. No matter what they say they're doing, they are always acting politically and trying to arrive at conclusions that um, affirm their normative priors. Well, this also seems right, but it's also a tough thing to refute. Hosnos decries the gradual acquiescence of ordinary people to, in his words, the steady erosion of their fundamental freedoms in the name of the rule of law. And he says, the rule of law is bad. The rule of law is a myth that we tell ourselves that conditions us into submission to authority. So he thinks that liberals, classical liberals, ought to reject rule of law as an ideal. However, the rule of law as an ideal rather than a felt reality aims to preserve rather than imperil fundamental freedoms. Maybe there are people with ulterior motives who champion the rule of law to achieve concealed goals. Um, maybe government in its current form cannot actualize rule of law ideals into practice. But when rule of law discourse does serve the repressive function that Hosnos describes, it is unduly coercive and abusive. In its proper form, however, and as it was originally understood, the rule of law as a concept aspired to restrain governmental power. In the minds of yesteryear patriots like Thomas Paine, the United States as a symbol epitomized rule of law. Thomas Paine said that in America, the law is king, whereas in absolute governments, the king is law. He added that in free countries, the law ought to be king and there ought to be no other, as in no other king, no other monarch, no other rule, no other ruler but the law itself. So if the law is no longer king in the United States of America, if the law is no longer supreme, I don't think it's because of Trump. I don't think it's because of Obama. I don't think it's because of Biden. I think both Republicans and Democrats have sought to weaponize the administrative state against political opponents. Both have undermined the rule of law, but yet both appeal to the rule of law as an idea. Is that a sign of encouragement that the ideal still obtains and matters? Or does it mean that Hosnos is right? Is it that the law is just bound up with these abstract general principles that can be applied in any way to reach the results we want, and therefore it is just politically charged and run by political animals and not by independent um, objective observers? Or is there something to this idea of the rule of law? Is it a good thing that at least left and right, while they may de disagree with each other on particular matters of policy, at least they agree that the law the rule of law is a good ideal toward which society should strive. So my title of, the, of, of this talk is, Is the Rule of Law Dead? I would say that the rule of law is not dead as an aspirational concept, but it is hospitalized. It has diminished in its effectiveness at, at restraining government because its application has been so politicized that its specific components, uniformity, regularity, consistency, et cetera, are rendered impossible to instantiate practically.